period of time while you rehab. So let's say you um, get your hip replaced and you go to the hospital to get your hip replaced and you have a three night stay and the doctor orders you that you need to be there for the three days. Sometimes now, many of you may have heard knees and hips um, might be done as an outpatient procedure. And if that's the case, then what I'm getting ready to tell you won't work for the care center for your Medicare. So you do have to have a three night stay in the hospital, not by your choice, but by the doctor ordering that you need to be there. And then they have to deem that you need skilled rehab. And that's where Broad Creek Care Center comes in with skilled nursing. If you admit to the Broad Creek Care Center from the hospital under doctor's orders for skilled rehab, and you have Medicare and a supplemental insurance, which I'm sure everybody in here, who's got Medicare, straight Medicare and supplemental insurance? And who in here has something called managed care, where you don't have the red, white, and blue card, but you use a managed care? Does anybody have that? Good, we don't have to talk about that. Um, so you would come into the care center, we would admit you, and your Medicare and your supplemental insurance would be the billable sources we, we use for your stay. Now, we can't plug in a, a code and say a hip fracture is an R42 and the person's going to get 21 days. We don't know how many days because it's based on your progress, based on your medical condition, and based on um, your therapy and how quick you rehab. Are you total weight bearing when you come out of the hospital or has your surgery been a little different and your orthopedist wants you to slow down a little bit and let your bones heal a little, a little more? Um, a Medicare benefit period, how many people have heard it's 20 days? How many people have heard it's 100 days? Okay, it's neither one. Um, the total benefit period for a Medicare stay is 100 days. But the only people that are going to get 100 days are a couple of pretty stark um, examples. If someone's had a pretty significant stroke, that's a really slow rehab. 100 days sounds like a lot, but it's a little bit over three months. And so if somebody has a terrible stroke and they're trying to rehab over it, they can chew up 100 days. Um, my mother, as an example, had long-term IV medication. So if you have to have IV medication, that's a scalable service. And let's say you need six weeks of IVs, plus we've got to get you well enough, you can chew up 100 days. But typically, it's based on your progress, your diagnosis, your rehab, and Medicare letting you stay there until they think you can be handled at a lesser level of care. So the first 20 days, where 20 comes into it, the first 20 days you're in a skilled nursing facility, if you need 20 days, Medicare is the only one that gets the bill. You might only be there 16 days rehabbing from your hip. So those 16 days, Medicare is the only one we're sending the bill to. But everybody's not ready to go home on day 20. So if you're still there on day 21 or day 22 or any of those days going up to 100, starting on day 21, we still send all of your bill. That's your room and board, your therapy, your um, uh, all of your supplies, everything about you, your medication, it all goes to Medicare, just like it did days 1 through 20. But on day 21, Medicare is going to take that bill and they're going to send $185 of it off to your supplement. Who in here does not have a supplement? Anybody? If you don't have a supplement, then that's your obligation. You would be paying what's called that copay of that $185. So we go along and we, and we keep sending Medicare all of your updates. The doctor keeps writing orders. We keep documenting how you're improving and how our goal is to get you to go back home and those kind of things. And in a perfect scenario, Medicare covers you long enough for you to get over what sent you to the hospital that sent you to us in the first place, in a perfect world. How many read and hear all about Medicare and Social Security and they're all wacky and you know, they're running out of money and they're cutting this and they're cutting that? So what happens is, in a perfect scenario, you come in, we rehab you, we document your stay, and in a perfect world, Medicare covers you, and then we do discharge planning, and we would be saying, okay, your last covered day is going to be this Thursday, and you'll discharge home on Friday. That's in a perfect world. In a less than perfect world, you don't quite progress like you would like to, or we would like to see you do, but Medicare may come to a point where they use the word plateau. You can be handled at a lesser level of care. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're ready to go back home, 
but they're not going to cover you. So you could find yourself or someone could find themselves needing to be in skilled nursing, but Medicare is going to come out. In that situation, we would be telling you and your family, uh, her last covered Medicare day is going to be next Monday, but the recommendation is that she remain in skilled nursing while we keep working on things. Or we have assisted living. We might say Medicare is coming out next Monday, that's her last covered day, and as of Tuesday, the good news is she doesn't need to stay in skilled nursing because we could transfer you to assisted living, which still has 24-hour nursing, still has assistance for all of your ADLs, which is your bathing and your dressing and things you might still need help with if you're still trying to get over your hip. And then you're in an assisted living situation instead of a skilled situation. When Medicare comes out the way I've described it, that's called Medicare Part A. That's the same Medicare that pays for you when you go to the hospital. Medicare Part A is what covers skilled nursing. How many of you have had outpatient therapy next door? That's Medicare Part B. So you have a different part of Medicare and that covers your outpatient therapy. So if you ended up staying skilled, but you had to go private pay, we'll continue your therapy under Medicare Part B. If you transferred to assisted living for a little while longer to get stronger, feel better, you know, be more sure-footed before you go home, then you'll continue therapy under Medicare Part B, but you'd be paying privately in assisted living. Um, if you transfer back home and you need home health, that's Medicare Part B. They might call home health in for a few weeks to check your, check your stitches, check your sutures. If it's a heart condition, maybe monitor you medically. That's Medicare Part B. So if someone is at home and gets really sick and their doctor says, oh, you've got to get into skilled nursing, there is no Medicare. Medicare won't cover you for that because you didn't come to us from a hospital stay. And so a lot of people will end up going to the ER for something. And if they don't get admitted, it doesn't mean they don't need to come to us, but if they don't get admitted for whatever it is, then we can't bill Medicare for that. How many of you guys have long-term care? Um, have you ever had to use it or access it or know anything about it? I know this is about Medicare and I'll let you ask questions in a minute, but long-term care is another, another way for Broad Creek Care Center to get covered. Um, it depends on your policy. Everybody's is different. So if you haven't checked your policy, I would tell you that you want to find out what your elimination period is. And that's how many days am I going to have to pay out of pocket to be in a skilled or assisted living facility before my long-term care is going to kick in. That's elimination period. It's usually 30, 60, 90, maybe 100 days. What's your daily benefit? When you took out that policy or your company took out that policy, your daily benefit might have been $95 a day. But over the years, it usually increases, just like your premiums increased. So you might find that you've got a $200 a day um, daily benefit. If you find yourself in assisted living and your elimination period has been met, assisted living is about $200 a day. So you pretty much, once your long-term care started kicking in and you met eligibility and we document that you need to be there, and you have to, uh, we have to be doing uh, two or three of your ADLs. It can't just be because you feel bad and you just want to be there. We either have to be helping you with your medication management, uh, assisting you in or out of a shower, those kind of things. But if you're in assisted living, you can pretty much, you know, be paid for. If you have to stay in that skilled setting, as I described, you certainly want to have that elimination period be ticking off because even if you have to stay privately for $413 a day in skilled, you certainly want to be in reimbursed that $200 a day. Okay? And the third thing I ask you to check is what's the length of your policy? Some of them are years. It might say it'll pay for up to five years. And some of them are a dollar amount. It might say we'll pay up to $500,000 over the life of the policy. Um, if your long-term care policy gets enacted because you're in a facility, um, your premiums go away. And they'll send you a letter that, and they'll even send you back the premium that you had paid that year if they owe you any of it because you don't pay to have the policy while the policy is benefiting you. Anybody have any questions? Specific questions like things that you keep you awake at night? Yes, sir. Assisted. Assisted living. And you run 
run out of money? Well, um, I've been there 14 years, and we have had in 14 years probably three people, four maybe, that um, we don't really get involved in people's finances. We don't make them bring us their you know, bank statements and check out their pro formas. We do communicate with their families regularly to know. And the rule of thumb when I started 14 years ago was I was taught to advise people, if in your current expenditure, this was 14 years ago, if in your current expenditure you're spending this much each month and you go, whoa, I'm about a year of running out of money we used to say you need to go and start trying to look at Medicaid, make a Medicaid application, because that took about three to four, five months to do that. Um, and in my 14 years, there's been about four people I can recall that ended up starting the Medicaid application and we helped them get to a Medicaid facility. They were still paying, but they were paying the Medicaid facility privately until their, until their Medicaid application um, was approved. We're not a Medicaid facility. Uh, Medicaid only pays for skilled nursing, so it won't pay for any of your assisted livings all out and about. It will pay for skilled nursing only in facilities that are licensed for that. And here, the skilled nursing facilities are life care located behind the hospital. NHC in Bluffton has some Medicaid beds, and um, I think there's still a facility in Beaufort that has Medicaid beds. So it's a concern of us because we aren't going to turn somebody out on the street. We're not going to wait till they run out of money and then just go, you got to go. But we do try to see if we can help, you know, navigate them. Um, Medicaid has changed an awful lot over the years that I've just been here and the little bit that I knew about it then. Um, you can't just all of a sudden start running out of money and decide you're going to give all your assets away and get Medicaid, because they have a look back, I think, of about five years. So if you had a house and a boat and another uh, you know, house in the mountains, you can't give it away or deed it over to your kids and qualify for Medicaid right away. Um, so we try to do the best advising we can. Uh, we can't accept anybody from the hospital that is Medicare and Medicaid, because I described how we could bill Medicare, right? But if they're Medicaid, and their, and their Medicare comes out, we would have accepted somebody that we can't take care of because they don't have a billable source. So if somebody's Medicaid, we can't, you know, we'll, and we get referrals all, all, all the time for those because I think hospitals all around the area are, are really trying to find a Medicaid bed, so they just send them out, and you have to weed through them and look down and figure out that we're not going to be able to help them, unfortunately. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm, for assisted living or something like that, yeah. Um, Can you repeat that question? I think you're saying if someone, was a, if someone was at home and you had some caregivers taking care of them at home and it became too much or you were going to need more care, could they come from straight from home to Broad Creek Care Center for assisted living? Is that true? Is that your question? Yeah, and you can. The process for that is, um, and I work very closely with Carrie or Sherry or even families or even residents. Residents will call and just say, you know, my husband is, you know, needing more care, you know, and um, caregiving is a great opportunity to stay in your home, you know, longer. But if you start needing 12, 15, 16, 20 hours of care, that's really expensive. That's more expensive than being in skilled nursing. It's costing you $500 a day, you know, if you've got 24-hour care. So, um, but the process is it's still an admission, so it's not a call us on a Thursday and we'll take somebody in on Friday. Um, we will contact the physician, um, and we need medical paperwork that tells us about the person and their medication orders and those, because it's still an admission. Um, it usually takes us about a minimum of 48 hours to get someone in. Um, the state of South Carolina requires something called a PPD. It's a little tuberculin skin test. It's a 48-hour test. Uh, the hospital does it all the time when someone's coming to us. Uh, they'll prick, prick your arm and draw a circle around it, and two days later, if you can't see anything but the circle, it means you don't have tuberculosis. But it's proof 
that a facility is safe to bring you in. So we need that done too. Sometimes the caregiving agencies can help with, help, help with that. Um, but yeah, you don't need to come to assisted living via a hospital. We do have some of that though. We have some people that don't really qualify for skilled, but they're in the hospital and the family's going, we can't take them back home. I mean, it's just too much care and my mom can't handle it or my dad can't handle it. Um, we, we will bring them in from a hospital, but they're coming to assisted living, so their Medicare won't help them anyway, you know, at that point. Um, memory care, we do not have a locked memory care unit. We do have individuals in skilled and assisted next door who have cognitive deficits of one, one level or another, but they are able to stay in a regular assisted living setting. Um, and everybody who has cognitive deficits or dementia or whatever you want to call it doesn't end up in a locked unit. You know, it doesn't mean that their dementia or their uh, confusion or cognition goes that way. But if we're concerned that someone does have that severe of cognition, we have helped them get transferred into a memory care situation. Um, when this facility was built, 20, we've celebrated 25 years, so we know how old the facility is. It was not built for an, an, a memory care situation. Memory care situation would almost be like this little rotunda here. Everything around here would be memory care. You know, you dine here, you'd have your activities there, the, the rooms off of here would be your rooms and the stack. You're just in, a, in an area where, and you could go out on a, a porch that's safe, you can't get out, but you can just come and go. And, and we just can't turn the care center into that. There's not, a, it, the, the physical plant doesn't allow us to do that. So, um, yes, sir. You can't use Medicare. Medicare is not paying for home care either. That's an out of pocket. You know, now if you have long term care, your policy may help take care of some home care. But if you're paying for a caregiver at home, that's an out of pocket expense and moving to assisted living is still going to be an out of pocket expense. However, it's $200 versus maybe your home care was costing you 300, you know, for the however many hours you needed. Two hundred, two hundred dollars a day is assisted living, and four thirteen is skilled. Um, our assisted living differs from other assisted livings in the area um, several ways. The state of South Carolina only requires assisted living to have eight hours of a nurse. Uh, there's nothing wrong with med techs, but med techs are the ones that are then giving out the medicine and being on hand with your uh, CNAs, which is your certified nursing assistants. That's the people that are coming in and helping you with your activities of daily living. They're doing the laundry. You know, they're making sure you get to meals. They're reminding you of your activities, you know, those kind of things. But um, V's standard is higher, and we've got 24-hour nursing. There's 24-hour LPNs in our assisted living, and then skilled nursing is 24-hour RNs. It's just a higher level of care. Um, the rule of thumb, to qualify for assisted living, you need to be able to only require minimum to moderate assistance in things. If it takes two people to get him up out of his chair, to get him to his wheelchair, that's beyond assisted living. You know, if it's just somebody helping you, much like if you were at home and had somebody helping somebody get up at home, you don't have two people around all the time to do that or equipment and those kind of things. So if somebody can get assistance of minimum to moderate assistance, they qualify for assisted living. So our assisted living, by and large, um, the, um, the people that admit to assisted living typically are coming to us after a skilled stay because maybe they weren't doing very well at their home out in Hilton Head Plantation in the first place. That's why they ended up in the hospital. And the hospital understands that not only do they need skilled care, but they may need assisted living. That's one of the other things that differentiates us. We have both levels of care in the same building. So it's a lot of the same staff. So it's not transferring you to a new facility. Uh, we also have uh, pendants and call bells that call our staff. You know, you, you're not having to use a life alert or something that calls you out somewhere else. You actually can get hold of our staff there. We provide transportation, all the meals, all the activities. We do the laundry, um, telephone, 
spectrum cable, your own heating and air controls, all of that's all included. We don't charge for levels of care. You may hear somebody that deals with assisted living that says, well, yeah, but now my mom or my grandmother needs extra care and it's now another $300 a month because they, it's almost like a, a a la carte menu. Oh, now you need medication management. Well, then we're going to charge this. Oh, and now you need us to do your bathing and your dressing. Well, then it's going to, and ours isn't, it's just the same price. We just keep it at the same price. We know who is a level one, two, or three. Our staff knows because we need to know the acuity that people were taken care of. And when you care plan them, then we know that we've got 10 people that are um, needing minimal care and we've got 10 or 15 people that need a higher level of care. We have 25. Uh, how many have been to the care center? I mean visiting or seeing someone. We've got 25 private skilled nursing rooms, private with private baths. That's another thing that sets us apart. If you're in the hospital and you go to another facility, uh, you may or may not get a private room because the other facilities have both kinds of rooms. And then we're licensed for 50 assisted living residents. Uh, that's the max that we're licensed for next door. Uh, prior to COVID, um, we, we had waiting lists of people, you know, trying to get in. During COVID, when families couldn't move their resident, they couldn't come from the Northeast to get mom out of skilled nursing and mom couldn't go home, you know, we were trying to move mom into assisted living and then people who were wanting assisted living that were living out in the community, they can't just get in, they couldn't get in by themselves because once again, their families couldn't get down here to help them. So it was a little different during COVID, you know, as far as the, the people that came in. We transitioned a lot of Tide Point people at the time that really needed it. And I think the shutting down of COVID for an individual that was living by themselves that was maybe, you know, not faring real well. Um, and we've had a couple of those came to us during COVID and then they were able to go back home, but they got the care they needed and they were safe and protected and didn't have to be worrying about being on their own over here and trying to get caregiving, you know, going on. So, um, you don't necessarily go from independent. There's people that never leave independent and you don't necessarily go independent to assisted living to skilled. We've actually even had people that are trying to buy at Tide Point. The kids live here and mom and dad are coming in from somewhere else and they're wanting to buy here, but no one was really sure whether they qualified for independent living. They've actually come to us for assisted living while they're going through the buying process here because once they got here and we started working with them, they were obviously independent living, but it's hard to tell when you're trying to read, a, read about them on a piece of paper from Boston or Philadelphia. So some people have gone assisted living to here. Uh, and everybody doesn't end up in skilled care. It just depends on your, you know, your medical situation. We do have a full-time medical director. Uh, you can keep your own doctor when you come to Broad Creek. You know, if you, you know, if you come for a skilled stay, we're going to encourage you to use Dr. Hall, our medical director, because he understands Medicare and he understands all the documentation that it needs to try to keep you covered under Medicare. But, but everybody's welcome to have their own doctor. Doctors just aren't going to come in over here. It's not that we don't let them they've just got their own busy practices and they're not going to. And so we would then be transporting you to go see your doctor wherever they are. Yes, sir. Unless you go in from a, yeah, unless you go in from a hospital. Mm -mm. Only if you admit under. Now, we've got some people that might come in skilled nursing private and then something happens and they have to go to the hospital. You know, let's say they're down there and they, you know, fall or have a heart condition. Something sends them, they get pneumonia, whatever, and they go to the hospital. They can then qualify with that three-day stay, and when we bring them back, we can bring them back if it's a new if it's a new stay of illness. It can't look like it's the same thing that you know they've had before, and it can't have resolved at the at the hospital. A lot of people ask too, how does it work if you were living on, over here? You were living over here by yourself, and you needed you came into skilled. And the discharge plan was that you really didn't, you know, everybody, family, you, everybody's having a conversation that going back home, 
was going to be difficult. You know, you needed extra care, more care, and you start looking at the finances of that. And are is someone really benefiting from living independently other than just really wanting to? I mean, are you able to get down here and do meals and socialize and come to the activities and, you know, come to lifelong learning and do all those things? And if you're not and you decide to, to, to move to the care center, skilled or assisted, if it's assisted, um, your fee over here does stay with your property until you sell it. So, so I'm always working with families and residents to be aware of that that you know, if, if you're really not gonna go back home, you should be recognizing that sooner than later so that you can, you know, there's a lot of new members, y'all have seen them here. There's a lot of new members and that's what's happened is you've had some people that have transitioned, put their property on the market so that their fee would go away because they're not coming back home. I mean, that doesn't mean you sell it the day you came in there, but you know, within reason. Uh, but you are always a Tide Point member. So that's why you probably have seen less of them. Some of you that are newer probably have seen less of it with COVID because, you know, we weren't coming back and forth. But Tide Point members are able to come over here even though they don't own Tide Point anymore. They pay no fees over here. Um, they eat over here just like they eat over there. The only cost that they would incur over here is if they come and have happy hour and buy a wine or they bring their family to dinner, they'll get a guest fee. But your fee is tied not to you as a person, but it's tied to your property. Um, so that's another thing that I think is important for people to understand because for a period of time there, and you may need to do it just so that you verify that you aren't going to be able to go back home. Because just because somebody comes to the care center does not mean that you're never going back home. Our intent is never to have somebody come for a skilled stay and never let them go back home. And our intent is never to have somebody transition to assisted living and say, you'll never go back home. That's, that's just not our, that's not our plan of care. We're, we then become involved with you and your family and Tide Point and wellness and everybody to just try to, try to come up with what is the best place. You know, because no one doesn't want to be at home. Uh, we'll do things like help get your furniture over to your assisted living, even if you're in there temporarily. Even if you're just transitioning for a little while, we want you to be comfortable. It doesn't mean we're moving you out of your house, but maintenance will help get some personal things over so that you, we're not going to do that if you just come for a rehab stay, but if you're going to come to assisted living for any period of transition, we want you to be as comfortable as you can be um, for as long as you're there. And then if it, the furniture doesn't need to be over there, we'll move it back over here. Yes, sir. We don't do the transferring. I mean, we don't make the selection. What we will do, and I spend a lot of time with families doing that, giving them the options, telling them all the places to look. Uh, I've even toured with some families because if they've already got a relationship with us because we've been taking care of mom or dad here and they're from out of town, they don't really know, but they'll tour and they make their own selection. There's several memory care. There's a couple of them on Main Street. Uh, it used to be Bloom, Hilton Head is now the Pines. Um, there's some, um, one of the coves on Main Street, I think it's Village Cove, Harbor Cove, it might be Harbor Cove, they change their names a lot, so it's hard for me to keep up with it. Uh, there's a memory care in Bluffton, uh, a Pines of Bluffton, there's Benton House out there near Hampton Lakes on the Bluffton Parkway. Uh, NHC, which is a really large facility on 170 out the back gate of Sun City, um, it's got independent assisted and memory care. They have a hundred skilled beds. We have 25. And then they have a, a separate facility on their campus. We're the only ones that are uh, attached. You know, we're all in the same building, skilled and assisted. Um, but we'll make, we'll, I don't say we even make referrals. We, we just will give you the information or give your family the information of all the places. And if, if, if everybody in this side of the room went and looked at memory care today, each of you would pick a different one. It's just, what, it's just what you're looking at today. The demographics, you know, how it felt, you know, what the, how you were welcomed, what the people were like. So there's a lot of them. And, and next week you could go look and you might pick a different one because it looks different. I'm not clear in my mind in the sequence that you described where memory care fits in that sequence. The chief things we look at with memory care is We've got people with cognitive deficits next door. And if you've been over there, you've seen people sitting outside. You know, they may be taking a walk around that circle where some of y'all go. If an individual is able to be outside, 
remember our doors aren't locked. When you go to the care center, that glass door opens and we can walk out. If we start being concerned that a resident really doesn't appreciate or understand what it means to come back in, remember, because we're not locked. So when that door opens and that person goes out and they could look, our residents, you know, fit a demographic just like you guys, you know, and, and if we, so we don't go, oh, wait a minute, she can't go out because she's used to going out. But if we're worried that that person, it's called elopement is the word. If we're worried that someone, or if someone is exit seeking, you'll have a lot of people, their dementia really accelerates. And what happens is they're looking for an exit. They're always packing their bags. They're, they're getting ready to leave because their mom's coming or their dad's coming or they're looking for their mother or, you know, those are concerns. Um, if someone with cognitive deficits is easily redirected, you know, Ms. Jones, come on, you know, your apartment's down here. Let's come on, let's go down here because they've gone into someone else's apartment, which would be upsetting to you if somebody came into your apartment. Um, if they're easily redirected and it was just a boo-boo, turned the wrong hallway, went to the first door on the left but was on a different hallway, those kind of things, those are reasons you need memory care. And then it can really go off the charts. You know, it could be somebody who just really becomes mentally unstable. And that doesn't happen a lot, because remember, I've only told you there's only been about four or five that have, you know, we've had to transition to memory care. Um, but it's basically an elopement. It's basically if someone is a risk of leaving, because if you're in a locked memory care unit, like I described a while ago, that screen porch right there, someone could get here and go out there and they're safe. And this would be all, you know, closed off and they could get out here and be safe. And you can do that on the back side of the care center because we've got that patio that's enclosed, but not our front door. You know, and so those are the reasons that someone would be, we would have to have a conversation with, with them, well, primarily their family, to just say, and moving to skilled doesn't even do it. Because you might go, well, move them to a higher level of care. Move them downstairs to skilled. Yes, there's more oversight in skilled, but the reasons you were worried about them are going to happen in skilled also, because they can still go out that front door, you know, or um, still get in other people's things. So everybody doesn't go that way, um, but some do. You know, some, some people's condition just accelerates so much, and that's the unknown about the brain. You know, you just don't know till you start kind of documenting it and knowing it and then we'll and we don't make rash decisions we just don't call a family one day and say whoa you know mr jones was out of control last night let's start moving him somewhere else we don't do that we care plan it we have meetings we look at it we keep them abreast of anything that's going on we put interventions in place maybe the person now needs something on their door to really tell them it's theirs you know they used to be able to know that theirs was the first one on the left well now maybe it's a pennant because they're braves fans you put a pendant on the door, and then they know that's where they're going. Um, so we'll try, to, we'll try to put interventions in place to keep people with us as long as we can, because particularly, and we do that for everybody, particularly if it's a Tide Point member, we want that person to be able to stay on this campus and be in this community where there is something familiar for them, and it's certainly familiar for their family. So we're going to do everything we can. Yes, sir. A skilled facility? I, I don't think I got the question. What skill level require? Education requirements. You mean to work in skilled or to be there? To work? To, to care for the people. To care for, well, V has tremendous um, training opportunities for all the staff. We've got ongoing education, e-campus learning, and that kind of thing. But to be hired in skilled, you have to have all the nurses are either RNs or LPNs. And all the CNAs are all trained and licensed, just like they are in assisted living. So our staff has the same training and the same e-campus and the same, you know, they have to go through HIPAA and elder abuse and um, uh, blood-borne pathogens. And there's, there's 20 or 30 things we, we have to do every, every year to keep being an in-service training and education. So to be in skilled just would mean that there's, there's registered nurses down there instead of L and or LPNs. Comparable to your own staff. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I heard of a situation where somebody went to the hospital, I forget how, maybe through an emergency room or something. The hospital admitted them as an outpatient. 
and they later found out that they didn't qualify for Medicare in a rehab facility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what happens is I'll get, for instance, and I'll use Tide Point as an example, um, over a weekend I'll get an email that tells me that Mrs. Jones went out 911. Doesn't mean Ms. Jones needs me, but they want me to know because I could come to work this morning and give a bed away and Ms. Jones might need it. So then what I do is I reach out to all the case managers at the hospital and find out, Ms., you know, I heard Ms. Jones came into the ER yesterday. And they're looking in there and they go, yep, she's still sitting in the ER. And I always ask, has she been admitted? Was she admitted or is she just sitting there? And the way the hospital's been so backed up with COVID lately, people can be admitted and they're still sitting in the ER. So we're doing the best we can to make sure that the person is admitted because I can't bring that person into us without already having a conversation with them and their family that goes, sorry, you know, you didn't have a three-day stay and they didn't qualify it. I've also been one that will talk to the family and say, you need to stop mom from trying to get herself out of the hospital because if, if she says she's fine and she can go back home, the hospital is going to just let her go. They're not going to try to admit her. But if the, if the truth is mom wasn't faring well at home and there's more to it than what you're hearing, we're always trying to see if we can't help that person get admitted to the hospital. Admitted. Um, but it does happen. I'll, I'll find out. I found out last week somebody went to the hospital, and I'm tracking them down trying to find out if they're going to need us, and the next thing I know, I found out they were discharged. You know, because, you know, so it happens. But the hospital can't admit somebody as an outpatient? Mm -hmm. They're only supposed to be able to have somebody as a, uh, they call it, they don't call it outpatient. They call it, uh, well, there's two things. Let's say you went to have a procedure done at the hospital and it's supposed to be an outpatient. Um, there's a lot of urological procedures that can be done that way. So you're going to the hospital that morning and you check into that little outpatient surgery center and you have something done. They can keep you just shy of 24 hours. So they might keep you that night, you know what I'm saying? Like you'll spend the night, but then the next morning their intent is to send you home. So that night that you slept there, you weren't inpatient. So the next morning, if you weren't faring well, you couldn't come to us anyway because you were, had a night that wasn't even there. But what could happen is, if you didn't fare well that next morning, they go, whoa, we can't send him home. Then they can start your inpatient status that day. So that first night you were there didn't count. But now, at the light of day today, you'd be an, you'd be an inpatient. So it's... Um, I'll have a call from somebody, tide point or not, but I'll have a call from somebody that says, I'm, I'm going to have my knee replaced, and I want to come to the care center. And then I go, well, you better talk to your orthopedist, because knees, three years ago, got canceled out of being an automatic go to the hospital and stay three days. So maybe you rehab with us in your first knee in 2017, and you did stay three days and you came to us. And so now it's like 2021 and you go, well, I'm going to go have my other knee done. I'm telling people, you better call your doctor because I can't bring you in skilled because you're not going to have a qualifying stay. So what we have done, and we've done this for Tide Point people, we don't necessarily do it for a lot of people outside the community. We've actually had a couple of people that were not going to be able to come to skilled nursing because they didn't have a qualifying stay, but did not need to go home for those first few 10 days, two weeks while they're getting over their knee, we admitted them to assisted living. So all of our paperwork came from the hospital. They didn't have a qualifying stay, so we couldn't bill Medicare, but at least they were well enough we didn't need to put them in a skilled bed, which we wouldn't want to if we didn't need to, because that skilled bed needs to go to somebody who really needs it. So we have tried to do that. But it's... Um, the hospital used to only be able to put you in what's called an observation status for 24 hours, and that's no longer true. I think that kind of went away because of COVID and the need for beds, and so they might keep you in an observation status a little longer in hopes that they don't have to admit you because they need the bed for COVID. You know, they have needed the bed for sicker people. Yes, sir. Not necessarily. I mean, they, it depends on their... 
No, well, long term. Well, do I? Yeah, but long-term care isn't going to pick up the day you came to us because if you've got long-term care, you've got to go through that elimination period and start the claim and all that kind of stuff. So it's not going to work. So what happens in that situation, though, is, yes, Medicare doesn't really care because you're not coming to the hospital and you're not having a qualifying stay. They think you can be handled at a lesser level of care. Now, it's backfired in a lot of situations because you've had some people since this, this rule passed, and I know, for example, because we've had them. They didn't have a qualifying stay. They ended up going home, wherever that was, and managing. And for one reason or the other, didn't manage well and ended up being back in the hospital, had to have a qualifying stay, and then ended up coming to us. Because everybody can't do it. You know, if you've got a supportive family, if you've got a spouse at home, if you uh, get the help and advice that says get some caregiving, you know, get a right at home or get a caregiving agency to help out at home so that you aren't risking your knee, uh, or your hip. Uh, they tried to make hips be this as well. Knees were in 2018 and they tried to make hips in 2020 fall under this where hips were not automatically that. I think COVID and the pandemic changed that. You know, they'll still try to, if somebody's relatively healthy, they'll still try to, they'll try to encourage you to be outpatient because that's just what, that's their new plan. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I do a lot of counseling, but I tell people not to quote me. So I'll have a family on the phone and I go, don't quote me, but here's what you should do. Because I've been in that seat with my own parents, you know, and I've seen, and so I, but I don't want somebody going, well, Lynn King at Broad Creek said we should do A, B, and C, because that probably wouldn't be very good with my relationship with the hospital. But I will, I will advise any and everybody I can to say that, because I've watched it happen. And not just tide point people. A lot of people get to the hospital, and, that, and that's the last place you want to be, right? So you're going to say, I'm fine. I can go home. I'm good. Yep, I got plenty of help. I get around fine. But that may or not be true. But if the hospital has that, and you've got a case manager who's trying to discharge 10 people that day, all of a sudden you became a really easy discharge, right? Because you go, oh, he can go home. Call tide point. They'll pick him up, and he'll go home. And that may not be in your best interest. You know, so some of it's driven by the person and some of it's driven by the, just the facility and the procedure and, and lack of beds and, you know, are you really sick enough to need a bed when they have other people that they want to put in the beds? Join them to, to stay there? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we do that all the time. I mean, you know, if, if there's one spouse over there and the other spouse has been somewhere else and then now needs to be over there, uh, you can't live in the same room because those rooms are only for one person. So then I'm looking for a double occupancy, you know, a larger, the, what we call a two-room apartment. You know, or you, or you rent separate rooms and we can try to open them up so they can be together. Um, but, yeah, but the rooms are only um, for one person, so we're only licensed. So a couple can't just live in one, the same studio where you were. If your spouse joins you, we need to get you into a... Because both need the care, though. Mm -hmm. One can't be well, one the other... Well, the well person, if the well person wants enough, that, remember, you're paying for it. Yeah. So you could have a pretty independent spouse just decide that they no longer want to be doing this back and forth and they really don't enjoy being over here by themselves. Because remember what I said, they're not taking advantage of being a Tide Point member. All they're worrying about is coming and visiting the spouse. And they're really, you know, they've kind of lost some of their friends. They're not participating and doing things over here. So it's pretty lonely to be sitting over there by yourself. And so we don't make you have to be assisted living. You can be independent if you want to live there. But not if you're in long-term care. You can live over there, but you're not going to, your insurance may not pay for you until you, and we had that happen. We had a couple over there. It was a Tide Point couple. We had a couple, and the fellow didn't qualify for quite some time because he was pretty independent. Did he need to be at home? No, he wasn't that independent, but he didn't meet the criteria for his long-term care. And then over time, he did you know, because we kept watching his care and his level of care and things that we were doing. And we would, we would revisit with his long-term care company, here's Mr. So-and-so's new plan of care. And it definitely showed that he declined. And then they were able to pick him up. So, yes, sir. You said if you qualify, Medicare pays for 20 days. Right? If you need to be there. Right. And then it goes down to $185 a day. 
Nope. So let's say you had your hip done and you come in and you're getting better. The first 20 days that you're there, we're going to bill Medicare, but you're not ready to go home on day 21. You still need some more help. So we're going to keep working on you and Medicare is now going to get that same bill they got on day 20. But on day 21, when they get it, they're going to pay all of it except $185. And if you've got supplemental insurance, then the insurance company gets that. So on day 21, you're covered under Medicare and your supplement if you need to be there. And it goes that way. But when Medicare comes out, your supplement comes out. So the supplement is only going to complement Medicare. How long does that go on then? As long as you need to be, as long as you meet Medicare criteria, if we can document and you're still meeting Medicare criteria, the most it could go up to is 100 days. Now, for a hip, you won't be there that long, but whether it's 21, 38, 41, whatever it is, as long as you keep meeting Medicare criteria after day 20, your supplement's going to join your Medicare until Medicare drops out. And when Medicare is ready to drop out, that's going to drop out. And the only Medicare supplemental coverage you're going to get is for additional therapy, not for room and board. Yes, ma'am. You go private pay. You go private pay. If, if you still need skilled care. In the facility, or do you go home with uh, right at home or something? It would be up to you. Okay. If you need skilled nursing, and you need skilled, I mean, you really need it. You've, you've done the best you can do, or the person's done the best, but you need to be there. You just turn private pay. Your care doesn't change. We don't move you to a new room. You know, we don't put red, red signs up that go, this person's private. This, you know, no one knows. Our staff doesn't know who's, only those of us that are in the management know who, who, who's private and who's not. But you would stay there, private pay and skilled, unless you had improved enough that you, you know, you've had a bad stroke and you improved, but you still need 24-hour care. If you don't need that maximum assistance, then we'd try to move you to assisted living and you'd stay there private pay. Or you decide you want to go home with a complement of care, that's between you, your family, and Tide Point making sure that it's a safe discharge for you. If you have another stroke, you start the whole process all over again? If you, oh, that's another way. Medicare, if you are, if, so in that situation, yeah, you would have to be out of the hospital or a skilled nursing facility for 60 days and have something unfortunate happen again that sends you back to the hospital for one of those new stays of illness, and now you'd start with a new bag of days. Okay, and what is the cost of private care? 413 for skilled. Okay. 413 and roughly 200 for, um, for assisted living. Okay. You know, just, we're checking on the cost of uh, care at the home. It's running $25 an hour now. Mm -hmm. I was going to say 25 26 The more hours you have, the companies will drop your hourly rate. So if you've got three hours of care, you're probably going to pay that. If you've got 24 hours of care or 12 hours, the more chunks of care you have, they can give you a little bit more benefit of, but it's still not going to be more than a dollar or two less. So I, I tell everybody to use 25 rule of thumb. If, if you had 10 hours of care, true, you might only be paying 24, but you might as well use 25 for your budgeting purposes. $600 mm -hmm. a week. <laughs> yeah. So, any other questions? We're not scary over there. Come see us. Um, I'm kind of like the dentist. You don't want to see me until your teeth hurt. Um, I'd rather see you over here. But if you have any questions or there's more people that didn't get to make it today, if you've got questions or somebody has questions, just have them call me. You know, I'll run over here and sit down and talk to somebody one-on-one. -on -one. Or if somebody has something, some surgery coming up, and you've heard them go, oh, yeah, I'm going to have my knee done, and I'm going to the care center. You now can be an ambassador of like, whoa, wait a minute, <laughs> you better ask a lot of questions because they may not call me. They might not know to, or they might not mention it to Sherry or Carrie. If they get wind of that, they'll start that conversation with them. But a lot of people don't know that, and, um, and particularly if you did it before and it was covered, how would you know that it wasn't covered this time? I mean, you really wouldn't. So, yes, ma'am. I don't get it from 911. The way I get it is when the 911 call happens and the concierge knows it, the concierge um, will tell, tell Carrie and Sherry, resident services and wellness. And if it's something they think 
pretty much I probably get an email from them that will tell me. And then what I have to do is figure out if that means the person needs me or not. Like I said, everybody who goes to the hospital doesn't need me. But let's say it was a fall or let's say it was some significant looking cardiac event, then they're a little concerned that I need to know. And that lets me be able to know what I might need. You know, that the person, okay, they went out on Friday, so they're going to be there through the weekend. And even if they get well pretty quick, I need to be able to know that we might need to have a bed for them. Instead of accepting someone from Beaufort Memorial that needed to come to us and their doc wanted them to come to us, then unfortunately I have to go back to them and say we don't have a bed to offer. You know, so I've got two beds right now. And I've got two Tide Point members that potentially need them. So nobody else is getting in you know, until I weigh that those people don't need it. And if they don't need it, then I can go back to the rest of the referrals. We've got 40 people right now trying to get in. They'll never get in because I, mean, I don't have that many beds. I'd have to vacate the whole place twice. But, but a lot of them want us really badly, and then some of us is just because the case managers are sending out to everybody because uh, there's not that many skilled facilities. We're part of Tide Point. Um, Frazier is part of Seabrook. Preston is part of the Cypress. Then I mentioned life care behind the hospital, NHC out in Bluffton, and Springer in Bluffton. There's only six places to, for somebody to go for skilled nursing. And if you live on the island, you really don't want to have to go out there. And if you live on the island, you've got drathers about where you'd want to go. So, thank you. Sorry I was late. Maybe it made it more entertaining. I'm not sure. But I apologize. I was working, and I apologize.